So the topic of our conversation today is going to be what makes a modern agency. And uh, oh, I guess the other pre-qualifier here, a little parental advisory notice. We're both very blunt, very direct. There's probably going to be some F-bombs, so just so you guys know. All right, so what makes a modern agency? Obviously, there's been a lot of changes in the industry. We've seen a lot of changes in advertising in general, and we've seen some agencies kind of fumble. What have been some of the mistakes that these agencies have done? We don't need to name names, but that have caused them to kind of slip up. Uh, that's a good question. I think that the uh, biggest problem is too many agencies actually aimed for the stars and couldn't deliver. And, um, and they relied on third-party partners, which is a pretty big issue, I think, in the space right now. Um, Why is that such an issue? You can't really control the supply. So, you know, you, you get affected by the cash flow issues, pay out too soon and catches up to you down the road and uh, at the end of the day, you get stuck. So, you might feel that you are cash flow positive, you're doing revenue, but as we all know, everybody who is sitting in this room, it's not revenue unless you get paid. So. That is, we've seen actually pretty big companies affected by this. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, it, 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 it actually is changing the industry a lot. Because um, uh, when, when you look at companies such as... <laughs> uh, Companies that we may all know in this room, yeah. not companies yeah. in this room yeah. that we know. Uh, I did not sign the NDA, but uh, uh, but pretty much, yeah. It's uh, it, uh, to be honest, it, it's pretty much uh, it's pretty much not being able to handle uh, to handle your to handle demand with your owned and operated supply. Okay. Uh, that's what I see. That's what you've seen. And so that's really where people have fumbled. They've had, uh, they've been shooting for the stars, they don't have their own supply, and, and everything you know, just goes. Grow too fast. They didn't have know, the infrastructure in place, all that fun stuff, yeah. Bite out too much. Bite off, bit off more than they can chew. Yeah, exactly. There Correct. we go. Yeah. All right, fair yeah. enough, fair enough. So speaking of kind of changes in the industry, you and I obviously come from the mobile space. Uh, we've been in that space for quite a long time. And, I think we can all agree for anybody that is in mobile here that the CPI space has changed pretty drastically over the past few years. How would you say that it's changed from what you've seen? So uh, I actually think that CPI as a term no longer exists. It's really dissolving very rapidly. Um, CPI cost per install, you know, there, this is five years ago. Uh, we're now looking at CPM on brand awareness, not just on mobile. You're looking on video. You're looking on using influencers. There's so many channels out there. Uh, when you're looking just at CPI, you know, you're lucky if you find a dumbass company that will actually be paying you money just to buy on CPI without any KPIs. And that becomes very difficult for companies that are focused purely on paid media to generate revenue. Uh, so in my opinion, it's, it's just a matter of time before it goes away. Goes away, yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of a shame to a certain extent, just for us as marketers, because I mean, I remember the beginning of CPI, I, I call it the gold rush. Those were the good old days, right? Absolutely. You remember King Candy Crush when that was first on the scene? That was just like, you, we were printing money. I always tell people, Candy Crush bought my condo. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I remember times when, uh, you know, there was premium SMS times when, the, when it was also making a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. know, And then it disappeared and some people are still paying that price yeah. for, uh, for, for, for that acquisition model, right? So, I mean, 
Uh, I remember times when, uh, when CPI, well, when was it about four years ago, when f five years ago, I would say, when it just started taking off, all you would see is incentive campaigns. Uh, they mean one company who is still buying on incentive. Guys, anybody? I think he's. Anybody's he buying incentive right now? <laughs> 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 he's selling You're it. You're buying? <laughs> no, he's selling it. <laughs> You're selling? <laughs> Is anybody buying? <laughs> really? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you my business card. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. I think in general, you know, CPI, the idea of just paying for an install obviously has, has evolved. I mean, we can be working with advertisers that may be paying on a CPI basis, but all of us know at this point, if the quality is not there, they're looking at all these KPIs, they're not going to pay you for crap installs, right? Yeah, Kurt, don't get me wrong. I mean, CPI still exists, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the topic of this uh, keynote, right, is mm -hmm. what makes a modern agency. So adapting to the curve, yep. that, that what I think makes a modern agency at this time, because you know, it's like surfing. You've got to stay ahead of the curve. All right. Uh, and CPI eventually is going to die out. You, there's still some revenue involved in this, but it's slowly dying out. I mean, there's a lot of examples, companies shutting down here and there. So, you know, it's just uh, it's a matter of time. Uh, and, and there are reasons for that because, you know, it's, it's not just mobile. I mean, as technology evolves, uh, at the same time, the acquisition model evolves. User looks, user is looking for a different funnel. They're not just interested to just install the app. And actually the demand, the advertisers evolve as well. They're not just gonna pay you for an install anymore. We all know that. Uh, it, you know, they try to implement as many funnels as they can into their product. Uh, and that creates a more complicated experience for the user when they actually download the product or they register or they do purchase. Um, and, uh, and that is why it's bound to fail. Got it. In my opinion. Right, no, totally understand. Yeah. So with the obvious changes that are, current, that are occurring in the CPI space, what are the challenges that you're facing specifically? And how are you evolving? Keeping advertisers happy. They become more and more greedier. Uh, you, you, you keep, uh, I mean, it's understandable that, uh, I think the biggest challenge, it's pretty much educating advertisers on the changes in the marketplace where it is no longer as simple as just, you know, just paying for install. We, we, we keep, uh, it feels to me, you know, as if a lot of clients out there right now, especially big brands, they're looking at rates that were acceptable three, four years ago yeah. that are not acceptable now. Yeah. Because absolutely. their expectations grow stronger, you have uh, you have a lot of channels. You have uh, you, you have a lot of saturation, which increases the bids, uh, which results in uh, in a very difficult process for supply partners to actually satisfy the demand. Yeah. Good deal. Cool. Uh, so pivoting away from like the traditional media buying, we were talking last have night. Have a beer, man. Have a beer. Yeah. Oh. Have a sip. All right. Cheers. Here we go. <laughs> so last night we were chatting and you were telling me a little bit of kind of where you're pivoting in terms of channels that uh, you're working with. And you talk specifically about micro-influencers. Uh, so why are you working with micro-influencers and how are you working with them as opposed to just going to these influencers that have massive audiences? Why not go to the Kim Kardashians of the world and you know who have millions upon millions of followers? Why micro-influencers? Uh, two reasons. Micro-influencers are cheaper because they don't have as many followers, number one. Number two, uh, it's actually if you find the right micro-influencer, it will create 
you can target a lot better versus somebody who has 2 million, 5 million users. Oh, 5 million users globally means nothing if you're targeting US. Right. Or if you're targeting a specific state or if you're targeting a certain category. You know, when you, when you actually narrow it down, the truth is somebody with 20,000 followers, for example, talking Instagram, Facebook, well, Instagram is the best channel out, out there right now uh, compared with Facebook in terms of followers, but, uh, you know, 20,000 users, 20,000 followers can be a lot more valuable versus 2 million users that are spread out all over the place. And uh, we're actually seeing it, this a lot more and more. And uh, this is why we are, this is one of our focuses for Q3 and Q4 at FMG. Uh, we are, on two sides, we're making it a simple experience for micro-influencer to take their influencers from mobile, for example, to video. At the same time, we can target by category Got it. on the supply side. So, Just out of curiosity, anybody in the audience, are you guys using influencers, micro-influencers at all? Oh, well, we could dive 50 cent, where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, we have another topic for our next conference. All right. <laughs> micro-influencers. Excellent. All right, so we've talked you know, about our traditional CPI channels. We, we started talking hold about... Hold on, hold on, sorry. So nobody out here is engaged on the supply side with influencers? Just curious. I, I no? Have, I have a comment. <laughs> yeah, go. So the problem with influencers that we've found is that they're uncontrollable. So if you want to purchase, if you're given a budget for cost per install or cost per engagement, mm -hmm. and then you go after some of these micro-influencer networks that are starting to pop up where they're, they're basically trying to monetize all that inventory for you on a performance basis, what we found is they can't promise control. So if you have a I tight budget this. for testing, they won't promise any of it. And the second thing is uh, we found that when we did finally do a test, it was, it was almost uh, the same type of quality as in scent. So either we, we oh, tested really? the wrong micro-influencers um, or we didn't. Uh, we, we even, pardon my French, but we even got in touch with um, Fuck Jerry. You, you know that one? Yeah, he yeah. is a cool guy. Uh, yeah, so we... we, uh, <laughs> we um, Can you educate those that don't know about Fuck Jerry? Yeah, sorry. So... Um, <laughs> If you're like me, a, a degenerate on Instagram, you really like the, the toilet humor. And um, uh, fuck Jerry, they, they came out of uh, New York and these guys just, I think they have 12 million followers. Mm -hmm. They're massive. And it's just a lot, of, it's a lot of funny content. But they started looking into monetizing their inventory. And what they did was they hired a college student who was an intern, who then took over as a marketing manager, who took mm -hmm. over as a director of marketing within like six months. And the problem was they just had no clue on how to monetize their inventory. Got so it. when we did approach them, um, it, it was like a nightmare. So I think, I think you're right. If you can solve for the micro-influencer uh, traffic and find the right niches and the right type of state targeting, um, I, I definitely believe that's where, where a lot of business is going yeah. because you're seeing brands now going towards influencers a lot more these days. But we haven't cracked that code, and, and it's interesting that you brought it up. So you mentioned, obviously, Fuck Jerry, uh, yeah. that is 12 million followers. I just like saying or Fuck something Jerry. something like that, but yeah. Beyond I that. I like that Aussie guy. Which Aussie guy? Uh, Aussie reviews, you know. Oh, okay. uh, I don't know, whatever. But uh, so <laughs> that, that was somebody who had 10, 12 million followers, right? Well, I, that's probably not as micro, probably, as who you're... Talking about, did you, have you tested with more micro influencers or have they been people more on that scale? So we, we did, and it was actually, um, I can't even remember the name of the company. It was uh, funny enough, a lot of these companies are popping up out of Florida. That's uh -huh. what I'm finding the reach so, out. To address your point, yeah. you mentioned influencer networks. Yes. That was the key point in what you said, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, I'll give a little bit of insight what we did at FMG. So we created a platform that makes it easy for somebody who has a certain amount of influencers to create their own app, which is 
basically a platform. So imagine, you know, when you, you know, when you have five, ten million users that you monetize on, uh, you have enough money if you are a super influencer, right? You have enough money to do whatever you want. But we're targeting users, micro to medium level, somebody with 500 to a million followers, let's say, and it's, uh, we basically, we create an app for them that gets installed on the mobile device or Appreciate on a smart TV, device. where they, w when their content is being posted, we do revenue share deal. Interesting. So you, it doesn't cost you anything. No, and I it's think, not a paid media deal, right? It's a revenue yeah. share deal. Yeah, I, I think actually it's it's uh, good that you said that because you even see people like um, Barstool Sports, yeah. uh, the CEO of Barstool Sports with his pizza app review. Like it started all online, right? And now his app is is bigger than it's following. So it's a really good approach. It's more control. Yeah, we we'll make an app now. for them yeah. for free. That's a very, yeah. And you know what? And with rev share in mind and all that, 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 solves a lot for the control of traffic. So it's a really good point. Cool. Oh, we got somebody else here. We got one more over here. So, so we actually, we've run a bunch of um, micro-influencer campaigns, like 10,000 to 100,000. Mm. And our for a bunch of our clients. And our clients all want to do pay for, it's all rev share for the mm. most part, mm. right? The problem we found is that um, Brands don't want to give, they don't want to promote offers through influencers, right? They want influencers to be promoting, like using their influence to get them to buy at full price, more or less. Mm. And so nobody actually buys anything. Are we talking on mobile, yeah. desktop, uh, which, yeah. which one? So mobile? Uh, they're primarily desktop in this case. Desktop? Like, yeah. So for example, like Reebok, right? They sent them shoes, influencers are doing reviews, great engagement numbers, like everything looks great, except this amount of stuff that actually got sold. Mm. And so that's Except what we right. haven't been able to crack. So I don't know if you have any insight on that. To be honest, we're not that engaged on desktop. Our mm -hmm. prime focus is mobile and uh, smart TVs, connected TV. Mm -hmm. uh, and from, let's just put it this way, we already have over 150 apps mm -hmm. uh, made for those micro influencers on four platforms like Roku, Samsung, Apple TV, and it does work. Mm -hmm. what, what's, the I, end, what's the end metric that you're judging working on? Like what uh, do you consider it works? So, so it's, it's, all, it's all pretty much programmatic. Mm -hmm. So we uh, imagine Wix for websites, mm -hmm. right? So same thing, we engage, uh, influencers, micro-influencers that already have a user base on mobile, but they're not monetizing it on the TV side, mm -hmm. on the connected TV side. So we give them the opportunity to do so. So we provide them with a, uh, of course there's commitment involved, right? Uh, in terms of revenue share split, but we provide them with a access to create an app to on the connected TV, and then they basically monetize those users on TV as well as an additional channel. Okay. So mm -hmm. to those micro influencers, it's a win-win situation, mm -hmm. not losing anything. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, we keep building out our presence uh, on that channel. Yeah. Cool, awesome, thanks for the question. All right, so pivoting, we've talked about you know traditional media buying or supply for CPI. We've started talking about uh, obviously influencers. Uh, what about video? How is video uh, working for you, and how are you u utilizing video with Huge. your clients? Huge. I mean, uh, in my opinion, we're too far from. I think VR it's what, five six years out. But in terms of connected TV, smart TVs, you know, when you're looking at uh, all the apps right now, uh, how the industry is moving, the TV is definitely a huge channel for us. Uh, I think eventually mobile is gonna stay there, but I think 
connected TV is a huge untapped market where that a lot of companies are just not aware of at this stage. Got so it. for us, it's doing well. For you, doing well. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Cool. Uh, and then coming back really to the topic of this conversation, what makes a modern agency? What do you think at this point advertisers are really looking for? What, is, what does the modern agency have to be? It has to be everything. Uh, well, what movie was it? The Gladiator? Everything and nothing. No? <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, no, times of networks are done. Brands are looking for some. Brands are looking for a one-stop solution. Somebody that can cover all aspects of their media spend. And I mean, us at FMG we do everything except for billboards and newspapers. You don't think those yeah, work anymore? We stopped doing that two months ago. Okay, got it. You saw a shift in the market, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but 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 seriously, I I, I think that uh, you know I think that uh, I think that companies pretty much uh, uh, serious brands they they just you know yeah they you know they think they can run social themselves they can do this themselves. Once you do a split test, once you prove them wrong, at the end of the day, you will get the budget. Yeah, and I think. And it's just, you know, it's more convenient for right. big companies to keep everything on one side. Right. They, they don't it's not easy to do, but. No, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Good deal. Okay, cool. So this is kind of more of a prognostication question. You know, we've obviously talked about what you've been doing in the industry, how the industry has been changing. Where do you see the industry going in the next two years? What, what trends do you see coming and happening? Where do you see everything in the next couple of years? Um, on mobile or where? As far or as- Which industry, what? Uh, we can talk mobile and- Digital marketing. And, yeah, digital marketing for sure. And certainly the direction that being an agency is. I think that uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of changes on the mobile side in terms of the app stores. Um, with everything that is happening right now, you have it's going to be more device based. We're already seeing it with the Galaxy Store on Samsung. Uh, they're investing a lot of money into pushing out their presence as an app store. There's more and more big brands creating apps specifically for the Samsung devices. So I think the times of just Google Play and iTunes Store, mm -hmm. you know, are pretty much done. We're going to see a few more app stores out there, uh, which is going to be very interesting because, uh, you know, I mean, just take uh, Huawei, right? How uh, Google pulled out uh, as a supporting OS for that device. So now they're developing their own app store. You know, so now you, you're pretty much going to see, and uh, mind you, they pretty much have, what, 22% market share globally mm -hmm. of the devices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're pretty compatible to Samsung. So, right, right. you know, we're going to see what we're seeing right now is going from Google Play and Apple Store to Galaxy Store, and now you also have the new App Store, which is going to be designed specifically for Huawei, right? Yeah, so, so we're basically going to hardware-specific apps and stuff like that, as opposed to just OS-specific, right? Well, it's going to be every. It's going to be both. Right. It's going to be OS with course, its own App Store. store. Right. So that is. That is a pre untapped territory. You know, if you're an agency, you're looking to make money and you're looking to target users or push out, uh, you know, I think, I think whoever is going to have the right inventory and supply to be able to target that will be ahead of the curve, as we spoke earlier. Right. You know, yeah. it'll be the surfer on top <laughs> of the wave. Trying to get there before it crashes, right? Be exactly. Exactly. Bam. Good deal. Awesome. Well, those are all the questions that I have. Are there any questions in the audience? 
Hold on, let's get a mic to you. Mic's running your way. Hello. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, CPI is dying, if, if not dead already. Mm. And uh, one of the reasons for that is CPI is an indicator of future profit, but not profit in and of itself. It's mm. the advertiser is going to, hey, make profit hopefully one day from that installed app, uh, and they're paying a commission uh, accordingly. Is there anything that can happen to, to evolve that or better align uh, which installs are actually going to lead to profit as opposed to just something else. So the more the affiliates are just focused on the install and not on the profit, that's one of the fundamental kind of problems. I think where it's going to go really is, is it's uh, pretty much going to, you know, like the whole CPI model, it's backwards. So you look at the install, then you look at another event, another event, another event, and then that's how spenders look at it that's how brands look at it they look at uh, their ROAS right on their spend they look at lifetime user value so what I think what I'm seeing right now is that it's pretty much instead of starting from CPI it's going to be more at the first purchase for example so you're basically skipping all those events and then the, the agencies that can, that can properly arbitrage it Right uh, or that have the ability where they have uh, their own products, their own inventory, uh, their own uh, not necessarily thir not necessarily buying from affiliates, but uh, uh, agencies that can really optimize and arbitrage that last event towards the CPI or the CPC or CPM, they will succeed. Because advertisers are getting smarter. Brands are getting smarter. And that, that is just what's happening out there in the industry right now. And even that initial purchase is, once again, a, an indicator of future purchases. It's, it's indicating what future net might happen. Um, what do you think about getting smarter about when we decide to say, hey, yes, this is a good customer or not? In other words, instead of paying by every install, Maybe someone who installed on a brand new phone that just came out this year, they're in an IP address in a very wealthy neighborhood. Maybe that's a better customer than someone who has an eight-year-old phone and is in a less wealthy area. Listen, there's a lot of maybes. That's why I work with Everflow. They deal with that stuff. <laughs> that stuff, though, that I was just mentioning? Yeah, they, uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you go through the funnel, right? I mean, it's... When you, look, when you look at the user data, you look 30, 60 days to actually make an assessment on a specific channel, on a specific placement. Why not a specific user? Well, uh, I mean, you're talking about uh, hyper-targeting, from what I understand. Using all past data to say, hey, here are the indicators -engagement. of past, con past customers that let me know exactly the value of this customer at time of action? Um, well, the thing is, there's not a lot of companies that like to share that data uh, because it's privacy sensitive. So, I mean, 100%. as an agency, yeah. as an agency, you can only do so much. 100%, which is why as an advertiser, whatever you're able to get, such as IP address, type of phone. Yeah, there are, you, you, you were talking 20 different stuff. categories, right? Yeah. You, like, you, you, you're looking at a lot of different categories. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, the more data you can collect, uh, that puts you in a better position, right? So you can target that user better and you can increase your ROI. And not uh, just that user, but like being able to create lookalike audiences. Lookalike audience, right? exactly, right? So I mean, we can, you know, there's a, uh, Everybody talked about programmatic four years ago. Programmatic, programmatic, programmatic. You know, it's great, but do you know how long it takes to train an algorithm in a sure. specific yeah. category? Yeah. <laughs> you need a lot of data for that. You agree with me, right? You need lots of data, 100%. Yeah. How are you going to get that data? Uh, you probably want to implement this plan after operating for a number of years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or you go out of business right? while waiting, right? <laughs>
hundred percent. It's uh, is for for those that have been going for a number of years, that evolution is is perhaps an opportunity of making use of that past data and yeah. changing it so that it's not just a payment, no matter what, but really uh, user behavior about that. And and that way, the the affiliates aren't aren't focusing on bringing in customers who are just going to install and then not do anything, not pay anything, and then everyone's losing. Yeah, well, I, yeah. like my two cents on that, Sam and I have had this conversation a lot. Uh, you know, when you start talking about specific users that you're targeting, you know, a lot of advertisers, they want, obviously, engagement. They want to get ROI based off of their ad spend, of course. But, uh, you know, the CPIs and everything need to adjust for that, right? The days of, like, $3 CPIs, of course you're going to get traffic that's going to justify that, right? If you want real high-quality traffic, it's going to be more expensive, and the CPIs kind of need to adjust to that. In my opinion, of course. I don't think I don't think you answered the question. Uh, I, <laughs> okay. Uh, if you stop incentivizing the bad stuff, mm -hmm. then that CPI can go whatever whatever you. What is your pay. background? Are you an advertiser or are you an affiliate? Advertiser. And okay. Just, what company do you work for? Uh, I'm part of One Click CPA. Okay. Yeah. So, so affiliate networks is who I'll deal with. All right. So uh, so um, you know you probably buy on ad exchanges, right? Uh, no. Well, you affiliates buy on ad exchanges. Sure, yes, yes. Right? Yeah. Okay, so how do you control that? How do I control what? Yeah, how do you control the inventory that they're sending to you? Oh, well, I'll, I'll look at the, the customer, all the information that, that I have about the customer. So their, uh, their address, credit card, uh, their, their name, whether it's male or female, all, all that kind of stuff are indicators to decide whether that customer is going to be profitable or, or not. And then basically, to be frank, I decide to pay or not. Okay. That's an interesting model. Uh, um, now, in terms of, okay, so, but that data is being collected through some platform, right? Are you directly integrated with MMP, which is like just AppSlayer, or it is a third-party tracker? Uh, we'll have our own tracking platform, uh, mm -hmm. but then we'll grab a lot of the data out of uh, Limelight and uh, out of Analyzer. So you, you essentially, you basically pretty much analyze the data, right? You have an ad ops team that looks at it. And then we'll paste it into one of our programs that, yeah, does, does a bunch of math. Yeah, so, so pretty much we, we, uh, we do very similar, right? Except that we look at a lot more a lot more uh, factors when it comes down to user, um, and we pay out on our traffic pretty much uh, unless it's fraud. But when you say limelight, I, 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 I think you're neutral, right? Yes, and, okay. and yeah. beauty, yeah. All right, yeah, it's a little bit different animal versus mobile. Yeah. Uh, but I think what you're trying to tell him is that he should get off of his own platform and go to Everflow, right? Pretty much. Okay. Just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The guys are right behind you. <laughs> uh, cool. And then I think, Conwar, you got a question? Oh, my God. No, man. <laughs> it's going to be some smart question that I will not know the answer to. <laughs> Actually, not a question, just a comment on the, the dialogue that was happening. So, mm. so I think you guys were touching on that. But you can take data that you're running with, right, um, and then aggregate it over time. So, you know, if you run a campaign or have run many campaigns, you've seen a lot of users, uniques in terms of, you know, let's say just in a geo in a, in a country. And, you know, taking an IP, coming up with a geo, that's pretty straightforward, right? Every platform does that. It's third parties that power that association. Now, there's publicly available data down to zip code level in the U.S. and similar in Canada, which will give you demographics, wealth, uh, in, in, uh, income information that can be overlaid on top of that. That right there at an elementary level will help you build targeting lists as well as suppression lists that you can kind of now roll into your ongoing campaigns to continue to kind of, you know, improve the quality. And then that kind of keeps feeding back into it. So, and none of this has any privacy implications. It's publicly available data. So, you know, it's pretty straightforward stuff. But it's surprisingly not that commonly done. Excellent. Um, how viable it is to integrate big data 
uh, into a marketing agency model. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. My background is actually in economics. And I see a lot of big data companies just emerging out of nowhere, uh, coming out doing amazing stuff, statistics, and all those kind of things. And I was wondering if that can help better target your audience and building exactly on his question, uh, what is the implication for, uh, fu for the future of marketing? Yeah, I mean, uh, to, uh, to go a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll answer starting from the middle. Absolutely, it will uh, increase your ROI as an advertiser. Uh, if you can create a lookalike audience and target in a specific way, Again, it, that, is, that is a concern right now. There's a lot of companies out there that are becoming more and more frisky sort of way in terms of sharing their data. And uh, you know, it really comes down to, uh, I think, your level of integration. For example, we just integrated, we just did a deeper integration with Adjust through our partners Everflow that allows that basically just tripled our data points when we collect uh, when we collect user data, which we now can actually create a suppression list and blacklist that can be plugged in when we buy on programmatic, for example, when we plug it in into our algorithm, which uh, you know realistically it actually increases your ROI times ten, and you actually get the user that will spend money, whatever the KPI is. It's a lot more accurate targeting, put it this way. But it, it, is, it is a big problem. There's, uh, there's less and less companies that are, especially when you're talking big brands, in certain sectors like FinTech, you will never get any data from those guys. They, they will not share any suppression lists or anything like that, and gaming as well. So, uh, you know, uh, you gotta come up with a solution. You gotta create it yourself. Or you can lose money for a year <laughs> and learn it the hard way. The right. best model, right? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, Pete. This will be fun. So I wanted to kind of uh, ask a question about micro influencers. Okay. So specifically, what's the strategy for like optimizing towards uh, KPIs when it when it comes to to uh, micro influencers? Um, like well, how do you optimize? Them? Well, to be honest, it's a revenue share deal. Oh, so okay. the strategy is generate more revenue. You plug revenue. it in and see what happens, right. and so, then you optimize based on that. If it, uh, I mean, when you look. When you look, uh, I mean, if you look on the advertiser side, they are not really losing anything because it's a revenue share deal. So we're not really charging. So uh, usually, usually what we're looking uh, when it comes down to micro influencers, again, it goes back to what I said, how the funnel is changing now. It's no longer CPI. It's usually optimized towards first purchase, or a CPA model. So, you know, users don't purchase anything. Those influencers can send all the traffic they want to send. They won't get paid on it. Okay. That's pretty much what it comes down to. What up? Get the mic. I can hear you, Jen. Hello? OK. What, what? Check, check. So to um, kind of piggyback off Peter, I think another thing is not all advertisers can do it on a rev share. So in our case, for our company, we don't, we don't do anything on a rev share just because it's healthcare related. So if that's the case and you're going to sponsor an influencer or even work on like a CPL performance basis, how do you figure out what the engagement is? Because there's a correlation that it's not actually correlated between how many followers they have and the engagement right. that they have. So, so good question. Uh, I think there was a little bit uh, misunderstanding. What I meant is revenue share with the influencer, not with the advertiser. 
you being an advertiser, you pay on a specific model. Uh, to be honest, CPL model is easily fraudable. Uh, so, you know, when it comes down to influencers, uh, I would prefer a different funnel where it's an actual event that uh, takes place, let's say purchase or an actual registration or you know, first engagement, whatever your funnel is. And then from there, you go backwards. So we would pretty much uh, plug that in with our micro-influencers and then we would give them the payout, the revenue share payout based on the actual event. This way, the brand is protected, and they're not really losing any money as well. I mean, they're trying to monetize on their followers, right? So it's pretty much a win-win. In certain cases, we can, uh, uh, we can arbitrage as well, where we simplify the funnel, uh, but that really depends on the level of engagement with the brand and how big the brand is and how much business we do with that. Because it I was going to say, are there specific metrics that you look at when you're determining like this is a good micro influencer for this brand? Is it that you know they have a certain percentage of likes to how many followers they have? We, post or? we, we look at, uh, to be honest, um, what I always say, it's always a two-way street. So when you work with somebody, when you work with a brand, you, you need feedback. You need feedback from that brand to be able to optimize. So, uh, of course, we would not just start sending you, you know, uh, ki kids to to a, to, a, to a health app, right, or a health uh, campaign. Uh, it would be targeted based on the audience. So we would, you know, look at somebody with the influencers in the in the same category semi what or you know it, it you gotta test it, you you know you you can't really uh it all comes down to testing at the end of the day but it's not just blind traffic where we just send you gaming traffic to a healthcare offer does yeah. it answer your question john yes thanks <laughs> all right <laughs> do you have micro influencers for john huh? do you have any micro influencers absolutely for well right. you talked about it yes, you're good we will. <laughs> excellent Two Everflow clients, awesome. Anyways, <laughs> any other questions? Everybody's hungry, I think. I think everybody's hungry. We also have some more <laughs> beers if anybody wants a beer. Guys, yeah. don't be shy. That's it? <laughs> no? All right. Well, All right. we're done. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>